Those who don't know me, Erica Demars, I'm one of the cardiac outpatient transplant and LVAD coordinators. I had the privilege of meeting our guest speaker today, Melanie Dodds, during the ITNS annual symposium where she talked about assertive empathy. Listening to her and with the population of patients that we see here in Detroit, I thought it was vital to bring her here to share her knowledge. Melanie's been a nurse at London Hospital, which is in Ontario, in the multi-organ transplant department for the last 23 years, and is really passionate about teaching communication skills to new nurses and also to the seasoned nurses who might have a difficult patient and not know how to deal with them. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to present Melanie so she can give this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for inviting me here today. And I'd also like to thank Sue for all the help in getting me here. Um, my name is Melanie, as uh, Erica said, and I've been a staff nurse at University Hospital, which is part of um, LHSC in London, Ontario, uh, for the last 23 years on the multi-organ transplant unit. We're also a step-down um, ICU, uh, level two ICU. We just have 12 beds, and um, our program's, I think, markedly smaller than yours. Uh, we do um, about 75 cadaveric kidneys, 30 living kidneys, 10 kidney pancreases, 60 livers, 15 hearts, uh, and we just started a pancreas after kidney program. I think we've done five so far. Um, and then we're also the care unit for the LVAD program, and uh, I think you've done 300, we've done 15. Um, so we're a little smaller. And um, <coughs> along with the transplant population, we also care for anyone else throughout the hospital that needs a level two um, monitoring uh, bed, so the BiPAPs and that kind of thing. Um, my goal today is to share my experience with dealing with difficult uh, patient situations. Uh, I will define for you the practical, teachable school skills of assertive empathy so that you might be able to better manage uh, those situations that leave you questioning why you entered uh, healthcare in the first place. You know those patients who we quietly put up with uh, who can cut you down at the knees with a single turn of phrase or disparaging look uh, and leave you completely bereft of all energy to continue on with your day, let alone your career. You and I both know that nurses in particular are experience, experiencing this each and every day and we've been uh, given few tools to deal with it. Before I get started though, I think it's important that I acknowledge that assertive empathy is not based on ac academic study or any literature. In fact, if you look up assertive empathy, you won't find anything I tried. I simply coined the term to better define the specific manner in which you deal with a difficult patient and situation so I could help my colleagues to cope. It's entirely based on my practical experience. I define it as caring with boundaries. It allows us to meet patients' needs for support, care, and advocacy while maintaining our physical and emotional safety and our sanity. For a very long time, I didn't actually realize that there was a problem dealing with difficult patients. I worked in the transplant unit with people with 20 plus years experience with transplant population. But about Three years ago, about 200 years of transplant nursing experience just walked out the door. So the seasoned nurses like myself uh, found ourselves working with novice nurses almost completely. At most, they had five years experience. Almost all had less than two. At about the same time, we began to notice as senior nurses uh, that we were frequently assigned the most difficult patients. Not the sickest patients, our fresh post-ops, our most critically ill. Our millennials relished the opportunity to take care of those those patients. Our millennials are smart, they're talented, and they're amazing, but they couldn't deal with these patients that we were often fell into our laps. They were the most physically, emotionally, verbally aggressive patients that landed with us. And further, if our young ones had to take care of them, they came out of the rooms looking completely baffled. They had no idea how to, to handle these situations. They would either uh, engage with verbal sparring, which led nowhere. They would uh, over pleased to the point of tears, or most often they would completely avoid the situation and really not go in the room more than what they had to. We'd heard rumblings that other areas in the hospital were struggling with the same issues. In fact, we sometimes received off-service patients from medicine and gen surge because their young nurses uh, weren't able to handle a patient or family situation. So to get a clearer sense of what was going on throughout the hospital, we sent out a survey Actually, it was my educator who made me do it. We wanted to capture more than the fact that nurses were experiencing violence. 
and abuse. We knew that was happening. It happens in every hospital across North America and probably around the world every single day. We wanted to get at how people were feeling when it was happening, what they were doing in the moment, and how their emotions around the abuse affected the care they were providing. So we asked the following questions. What verbal behaviors have you encountered uh, with, uh, from patient or family? What physical behaviors have you encountered from patient or family? How did you feel during the interaction? How did you feel after the interaction? And what strategies with difficult situations with patients and families do you have? So after we asked that, we got 161 respondents, and the results were rather stunning. If you notice, the first of all, one-third of our, the people that responded had zero to five years experience. One-third had 20 plus, and then the other third was six to 19 years. So from that, you can see that our young ones have, are afraid, and our older ones um, are really angry, and they all have a lot to say. Not surprisingly, the results reflected our experience as well. 80% of the respondents have, have experienced threatening, bullying, belittling, patronizing verbal interactions. Alarmingly, but sadly not surprising, over 80% have been physically assaulted in some way, whether it's had your hair pulled, been hit, or kicked. A lot of nurses are suffering emotional and physical abuse, and they're feeling disempowered, embarrassed, afraid, angry, and humiliated. Frequently, nurses are coping by debriefing with colleagues. They are needing to change assignments. And most often, they're reluctant to re-enter the room, which you'll, really affects the therapeutic relationship and doesn't really allow for good patient care. If you're not there, you can't actually take care of a person. The comments were the most upsetting to me. Um, if you, if you read the, the comments, um, for the zero to five year nursing, uh, nurses, they were really finding that um, they were not prepared at all. Um, it takes time and practice, this person said, and they weren't given that. And then try not to let patients think that their remarks have affected them because they know they want a, react, they want a reaction. The third one was really affected me. I, think, I try to think positively, be brave, and do my best with the situation. I don't think we should have to come to work to be, and be brave. And then I find it difficult to be assertive because I don't want the patient in or family's behavior to get progressively worse. And as you move through the years, you'll notice that at six to 10 years, they uh, find support from people. And then by the time you're 20 plus years, no one's supporting you, and they're angry. From the survey results and our own day-to-day -day experience, it was clear that we had a problem. Our amazing, energetic young staff seemed to lack an entire skill set that would enable them to deal with these difficult situations and maintain their sanity. We needed a solution. So we began to talk and watch and listen to how each other dealt with these situations in order to figure out the difference and thereby discern a solution. My epiphany, though, came in the form of a delightful 22-year-old young man we'll call Billy. He was admitted with rejection due to non-compliance. He was just lovely, a ball of anger, frustration, and fear, who spent the first week of his stay terrorizing the cardiology nurses and the next 36 hours yelling, swearing, and throwing things at our young staff. And then my set began. For the next five days and four nights, we traded Billy back and forth between myself and two other senior nurses, Peggy and Tracy. By the end of the week, he'd stopped yelling and only swore in his room, and he said please and thank you most of the time. So what had we done differently? What were we saying? How are we saying it? And what were we, how are we doing it while maintaining a strong therapeutic relationship with this little juvenile delinquent? After some thought and much discussion amongst all the nurses, we were able to define a set of concrete skills that allowed us to provide care with boundaries, balancing our needs and wants with his needs and wants. Through the teachable, learnable skills of assertive empathy, we were able to strike a balance with this young man, meeting his need for support and care and advocacy and our own need to maintain our physical and emotional uh, safety and, most importantly, our sanity. 
Assertive empathy is simply caring with boundaries and it is about achieving balance within the therapeutic relationship. When put into practice, assertive empathy consists of a set of skills that can be divided into five areas of focus that balance the needs of the patient and the nurse. The acronym spells peace because that's really what we're all after. First, permission. From the nurse's perspective, permission, regardless of what patient situation we are dealing with, as nurses, both individually and professionally, and as a profession, we must first give ourselves the permission to be respected. This is a cultural shift. Historically, nursing has wrestled with low professional esteem. The public sees nurses as ministering angel angels who should put everyone else's needs first. In school, we are taught that the therapeutic relationship is sacred that we need to be understanding and compassionate at all times because both patients and families are scared and in pain and struggling. And all of that is true, but that does not give them a reason to, uh, to behave aggressively toward us. But how many times have you been told by management and colleagues that this is just the way that it is for nurses and that we need to change our behavior because patients, surgeons, and management won't change theirs? And so it follows that nurses continue to have trouble giving themselves the permission for respect. With Billy, we absolutely needed to change our behavior so we didn't get stepped on, but so did he. We needed to give ourselves permission to insist on his respect. But Brene Brown, does everyone know who Brene Brown is? She's amazing, she studies compassion. Um, she does a lot of TED Talks. Um, we can't ask people to give us something that we do not believe we're worth receiving. On the other side of the coin, for the patient <clears throat> with permission, is permission for the patient. What could we possibly have given our young Billy permission to do? He was already, already breaking every rule that we could think of. What more could he do? But I have found that the most profound gift we can give our patients is the permission to be sick. It sounds kind of ridiculous. However, one of the most powerful things that we can say is, this really sucks and it's okay to feel bad about it. And I said that to Billy during our first hour, and his relief honestly was palpable. I just said that it was okay for him to feel, that, to feel like he felt because rejection is a big deal. He was fully aware that he'd messed up by not taking his meds, but he still had the right to be afraid, and if his language was any barometer, he was certainly asking for the permission to be angry too. Some patients will apologize after you say something like that, and your day will proceed with rel in relative calm. However, Billy was not most patients. So I followed my I understand but statement with a very specific set of rules and boundaries. These are just my hot buttons and I use them with all my challenging patients and you can adjust it as you see fit. I said, our day will go much smoother if we both follow a few rules. First, I will respect you but please respect me. Notice that my respect for him was unconditional. Second, it is important to me that we both say please and thank you. And then I did. I said, thank you for your arm, for your blood pressure. Thank you for not swearing outside your room. And three, I'm happy to help you, but please ask. Don't demand things of me. Again, unconditional help, but life would be much easier if he was nice about it. This set of rules allowed for caring with boundaries. It kept everyone safe and held each of us to account within the therapeutic relationship. I could call him out on his behavior, but he could call me out on mine too. And trust me, he did. These conversations can feel awkward and forced to start. It isn't easy, but again, Brene Brown says, how can we expect people to put value on our work when we don't value ourselves enough to act and hold uncomfortable boundaries? Just as with permission, expectation is a two-sided coin. To maintain balance, it is important it was important that, that I was clear with Billy about what to expect with regards to goals of care. And I'm not talking about big philosophical discussion about code status and end of life and that kind of thing. I'm talking about the nitty gritty of how the day was going to go. Doing with this with every patient is quick and easy and the payoff is well worth the time. At the beginning of the, each shift, I would start by, out by saying something like this. It is important that we achieve these three things today. You need to take your meds. You need to get up and walk twice and I have to do your vitals with every meal. Are you good with that? When do you want to take a walk? And do you have anything that you want to accomplish today? And then I would write the goals on the glass walls. We have glass on every side, and I feel like a bit of a rebel when I write on them. Initially, he would swear under his breath, but not at me, and then tell me he thought he could do each item on our agenda. 
Sometimes there was negotiation, but generally things got done. Beyond meeting all the goals for the day, there's a bigger payoff with every patient. If the patient and family know what to expect, they have a framework within which they can ask questions. They, and they know how far they can push the boundaries. They feel more in control, have input into their basic plan of care, and they are less likely to have anxiety and frustration, and in turn, they are less likely to lose it and become abusive. But be careful to maintain your boundaries. The difference between allowing the patient full control so that they think that they're running the show and working in a cooperative framework is subtle but profound. State your own needs with regard to time in particular. We're all busy. When we allow patients to be fully in control, we tend to overplease to the point of crying, and then we end up back where we, where we started, being walked all over. But if we give patients no control, they become frustrated and angry and can easily escalate. But if you expect, express your expectations clearly while allowing patients input into setting their expectations, then you can really find the balance. And with Billy, we did that most of the time. Assertiveness is the A in peace. Okay, so you've set, you have the skills to give yourself and your patient permission to be respected. You have the words to set expectations and boundaries. What else do you need to handle the next Billy that comes into your unit? The real, the real difference between success and frustration in these situations comes down to, it doesn't just lie in your words. I can say the same words three different ways and get three completely different reactions. The secret is to be assertive, not meek and apologetic, and definitely not aggressive. Okay, so there I was at Billy's door, who I know had made everyone cry. All of my colleagues had cried at one point taking care of him. Uh, I was about to go in and establish some ground rules. What was I going to do first? And trust me, I actually did this every single time before I walked into that room. First, I would take a deep breath and give myself permission to be respected. Second, I consciously would bring my shoulders back and hold my head up so that I would meet him like this and not like this. I would make eye contact with whomever was in the room because his family was just as much of a mess as he was. And then I would introduce myself every single day so he wouldn't forget who I was. Even when you set, set that tone with your body language and your, ex, uh, and, and your expectations, patients and families still lose it sometimes, and Billy often did. They are really stressed. This can be a life and death, death struggle, and it is exhausting. So when it happens, you can work by yourself to diffuse it without a code white. Is that what you call it here? When you call security, we call it a code white. And so it was when Billy went off on me and told me that he wanted to pound the crap out of me. <clears throat> I used my body language again to try and shut, down, shut it down by reestablishing my boundaries. I put my hands up just like this to create a physical boundary. It was a nonverbal indication that he'd gone too far. Then, while maintaining a confident stance, I met his eyes and I restated my, I understand, but, but, and then I reiterated my rules. He still escalated, so as crazy as this sounds, I sat down. I kind of shocked him, as he was expecting me to be angry or afraid and to either engage him further in verbal sparring or to turn and walk out of the room. He actually asked me what I was doing and said, aren't you scared of me? I said, not really, I know I can outrun you right now. And then I smiled. If you, if you feel you can do this safely, sitting down very often leads to de-escalation and the opportunity to have a conversation about what really is happening, because the problem very rarely is you. And the discussion that follows only serves to deepen the therapeutic relationship. Sort of assertiveness with the patient isn't really about the patient having becoming more assertive. Uh, as with expectation, you might wonder why a patient like Billy or any other difficult, pa difficult patient might need to be more assertive. True enough, but this really is about your assertiveness, and it's really crucial, particularly when patients and families are escalating. That positive body language that I was talking about can say, I've got this, I know what I'm doing, and you can trust me which again can alleviate a lot of anxiety for the patient and the family, and also for you, because you can tell yourself to, in your head that you know you've got this. Being assertive with patients and families strangely increases their trust in you as you seem in control and more willing to advocate assertively for them with the team. So, Billy went from believing I was fighting against him to believing I was fighting for him. If I was assertive enough to put up with his yelling and carrying on, then I was more likely willing to assertively advocate for him with the team. 
I was able to demonstrate this stability when he grew frustrated with a very green resident who placed a lot of unreasonable expectations on him one day. I just said, he's being really difficult, Billy, but we really need him to rewire your IJ. Just get in that bed and don't say a word. We need this to keep you alive. I stayed with him and as Billy called him every name in the book under his breath, I ran interference and we came to a workable, albeit uneasy truce. But you must guard against aggression. Aggression and trust have, a, have an inverse relationship. The more aggressive you are, the less trust you garner. And that's, that leaves no more good. It impacts care and leaves everyone unhappy. But trust me, this is not always easy. I am just as guilty as anyone, especially on night shift. I hate night shift. Recently, I had a patient who pushed my disrespect buttons hard and often. I think it took about five minutes to me, for me to be done with this patient and family. I was aggressive and I did not set my boundaries diplomatically, nor did I appropriately set my expectations. I was so done with him, things quickly degraded and no one was happy and his care suffered. And I, I wasn't happy and he wasn't happy. So be aware, go back to your boundaries and set expectations and work to live up to them by your, yourself as well. C is for courage. This balancing act is hard. It takes courage to speak up because it is not without risk, but to ignore it and do nothing comes at a far greater cost. The first time and the fifth time and even the 25th time you deal with a difficult situation, you'll go in shaking and come out shaking harder. It's tough, I'm not gonna lie. When I first dealt with Billy, I came out of that room and I found Peggy and I debriefed, and really, I just unloaded to her. We have been told our whole careers that the patient is first, so setting our own boundaries is counterintuitive, even when patients are nasty. Telling even an abusive, aggressive kid who'd made my colleagues cry to shape up should have made me feel better, but it doesn't. It still makes me shake a bit inside. But we must support one another to build the courage to communicate with confidence and change the culture professionally and individually. What does that mean day to day? It means supporting each other when we are faced with difficult patients, reminding one another that we deserve to, to be respected and that we have permission. And here's the tough part of that. We have to stop throwing each other, other under the bus. You and I both know that that happens. If a patient or family complains to us about a colleague, whether it's a physio or a physician or another nurse, it's really important that we support our colleagues and of course listen to the family and, pa and to the patient. We must have the courage and confidence to not be the favored nurse, the favored physio or the favored physician. It costs everyone if we do that. You and I both know it happens and it's toxic for everyone. So don't step on someone else to rise above. We can all rise above together. We most, must support one another to build the courage to communicate with confidence. And as Brene Brown says, daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to protect ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. Courage for the patient. Just as we have fear, our patients do too. Transplant is fraught with uncertainty. Our patients have no control what, whether they will get a transplant, if and when they will get a transplant, or if they will get through a bout of sepsis or rejection. It takes courage to look death in the face and keep walking forward. It is important to re remember this and to recognize it. And so it was with Billy. As time went on, he got sicker and sicker. He was on pressors and his ejection fraction fell to 20%. He knew he was close to the edge and his mood reflected it. I sat down beside him and said, this is really difficult. Nothing seems to be working right now and you're mad at us and you're mad at yourself for kind of putting yourself here. It takes a lot of courage to get through but it is your choice. We can't force you to fight. It is okay if you say you've had enough. It takes just as much courage. He, like almost all the patients I've had this conversation with, chose to continue fighting, but stating it outright seemed to calm him and, he gave, and gave him courage to face whatever was coming next. He had difficult conversations with his family and the team with the nurse beside him to give him support and he dug in. Empowerment is the final part of peace. Assertive empathy is rooted in the idea of empowering the nurse and the patient within the therapeutic relationship, and I think we did that with Billy. The literature about empowerment of nurses speaks mainly to the nurse management interaction. 
There's very little about empowering nurses in the nurse-patient interaction, except to say that we shouldn't have too much power over them. But here's the balance again. If we have the courage to give ourselves permission to set boundaries and expectation in an assertive manner, then we can be empowered to prevent these, situation, these highly charged situations from becoming violent while still providing empathetic care. We don't have to rely on our charge or our coordinator or the physicians to come in and protect us and scold the patient and tell them to be nice to the nurses. We can manage and de-escalate de them ourselves with all those people standing behind you in support. We become our own solution. Equally, when patients are given the permission to be sick, understand expectations, and believe that nurses will advocate assertively on their behalf, they too feel empowered. We become a team, and the hospital stay is no longer a problem to be solved, but rather something that we can help them learn to get through. By the end of the week, with Peggy, Tracy, and I, even our quietest, most timid nurses were taking care of Billy. He stopped yelling said please and thank you, and actually felt that he was somewhat in control of the situation. He realized that we couldn't force him into anything. Billy actually started trying to turn things around. He took his meds, went to physio, and actually got better, but on his terms. Through a sort of empathy, he was empowered. He did get better and go home. I think Billy ranks up there as one of our most challenging patients. But because we were able to, to, as a group, use a specific set of skills consistently to provide the care that he needed within the boundaries that we needed, he became one of our greatest successes. By the end of the admission, all of the nurses were comfortable providing care for him. It's more than the physical grind of nursing. It can be these kind of patients who cause us to feel angry, afraid, frustrated, or embarrassed, and that lead our smart, talented young nurses straight at the door and leave the rest of us behind exhausted and bitter. We're all vulnerable, but as we saw with Billy, assertive empathy really can work, and it is important. Our job is hard. But if we give ourselves and each other permis the permission to expect respect through assertiveness, assertiveness courageous, cor and co courageous communication, we can be empowered to create a safe work environment while providing quality, empathetic patient care. Now, I know that you're going to ask me how I know that assertive empathy works. Have I done any studies or published a paper or taught this at a university? The answer to those questions is no, not yet. I'm a nurse. I work at the bedside, and I continue to use these, this set of definable skills every day, and it works. My young colleagues demonstrate with each new challenge they face that these skills can be taught. They can be learned, and they are empowered by their newfound skills and have control, and have control over uncomfortable situations, and they beam. But it was my favorite sweet juvenile delinquent who was my teacher yet again. Billy came back to us in February. He'd stopped taking his meds after he was arrested for armed robbery and assault with a weapon. I guess jail kind of got in the way. He was on bail when he came to us. By the time he came in, he'd had a rip-roaring rejection, leaving his ejection fraction at less than 20%. His heart was so scarred that it was like stone. After some time in the CCU on a balloon pump, he again landed with us because he was driving the nurses upstairs crazy. I happened to be working when our sweet young Billy came down. He took one look at me and said, I'm so glad you're here. Remember that time you got mad, so mad at me? To which I replied with a smile, which time? You know, when you turned all red in the face and then closed the door? And they turned to my colleagues and said, I always knew I was in trouble when she closed the door. <laughs> yep, I remember, and I'll do it again if you treat anyone like you've been treating them upstairs. And here's the key. He said, no, I know. I would never treat you that, that way here. Everyone treats me differently here. You listen and you make me feel safe. I like it here. I promise I will follow the rules. And he did, for the most part. He only struggled with a couple of nurses who were new to our area. They were not comfortable with our unique style of, co of communication yet. They either engaged in ver verbal sparring or threats or over to the point of exhaustion. The rest of the staff quickly reestablished a therapeutic relationship with Billy. He felt safe. He felt cared for. We gave him permission to be angry with himself and angry with being sick again. He had permission to be afraid, and we all took a deep breath and gave one another the courage to maintain boundaries and go to the uncomfortable place in places that even the phys physicians found daunting. We were able to assertively advocate for Billy throughout his time with us. He trusted us enough to talk about his hopes, his dreams, and most importantly, his fears. We helped him find his voice with the team and with family. 
He knew he'd burned almost all of his bridges with family, and his greatest fear was that no one loved him enough anymore to have a funeral for him if he died. He worried that no one would remember him and that he wouldn't have a tombstone and be able to be buried next to his grandfather. So we reconnected him with family, ensured that he had an appropriate power of attorney, and ensured that his wishes were known and followed. And then, when the time came, we were able to give Billy the greatest gift we as nurses can give a person. As Billy's heart failed for the last time, he did not call out for family or push us away. He called for Peggy, and she came. Billy died peacefully in her arms. The circle was complete. Through her immense skill and compassion, over two and a half years and three arduous admissions, Peggy had bridged the gap between an angry, foul-mouthed boy who'd physically pushed her away to an equally terrified boy who trusted her more than anyone else to bring him comfort and calm in the last moments of his life. So I know with absolute certainty that assertive empathy works. It has the power to transform the lives of our patients and just as importantly, the lives of our nurses. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. Thank you. That was excellent. I hope you all enjoyed this talk and can take some key points home with you. But I'm going to open the stage up to some questions, and I hope there's a lot of them for Melanie. Someone wants to start? There are no questions? I actually have one. So Melanie, you're saying that um, you teach this assertive empathy with the PEACE acronym to your nursing staff. Have you taken it throughout the hospital so that all nurses can see how you're dealing with these patients? Because you mentioned he came back and he was belligerent, nasty to the nurses on the other floor. I'm a, I'm a staff nurse, and uh, so my power is limited. So no, I teach it to my colleagues as, and it's not anything formal. It's just what we do. So um, it's not something that started yet. I've t spoken to my educator, and I've gone to the educators, but it takes time to get traction for things and for them to see how it works, I guess. But no, I haven't taught them. <laughs> we just do it. Yeah, we just do it. Janet has a question. Uh, are you saying, Melanie, that you should just, as you're talking amongst yourself, not on a formal basis yet, but you're trying to... Yeah. Can everybody it? hear that question? So basically, Janet's asking her if they teach just in speaking with other nurses. It's informal. So probably through orientation as you're teaching nurses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I don't have anything formal that I teach. I went up and ta uh, did some, taught the neuro nurses how to do it because neuro, I don't know if it's like that here, but it's such a demanding floor to work on. They have huge turnover and they're always young and they were getting, they were getting beat pretty bad up there. So I went up and, and did some teaching up there, but that's the extent of what I've done. And for us, it's just, uh, we're a small unit. There's only 18 full-time staff and then four part-time staff. So it's easy to work through, but it, it just comes through working and through talking and it spreads throughout. So it's not, it's a cultural thing more than it's a, a formal thing. It's about changing culture and also when the conversation happens with a, about a patient that's really frustrating people, instead of um, blaming the patient, we go back and have a conversation about how we can meet their needs and that kind of thing. So it's, it's informal right now. Um, I think it, it didn't come from the literature, because um, if you look it up, there's not much. Um, all of the literature is about empathy, and um, there's not much about how to deal with difficult patient situations except to be more empathetic, which doesn't actually work. Um, so it just came from talking. Um, my friend, my colleague Peggy, she's, she and I drive to work together, so it came from that. Um, and it came mostly from dealing with Billy. He, 
he was kind of the quintessential example of someone who actually was physically abusive towards uh, our staff when he first came, when he was first transplanted. Um, when I said that he pushed Peggy, he actually physically pushed her. He was very difficult to deal with. And so we had that experience to draw on and we just talked about it. And then when we had, a, uh, we were able to, to manage him and our young staff weren't, then we just talked casually with our young staff to see, to ask them and what it was they were saying versus what we were saying. And so it just developed that way. So it wasn't, it, it was an informal process to get to here and I just put it together in a more structured format to make it easier to learn and talk about. Is there any other questions? Well, I have one last one. I'm hoping you're writing a paper on this. <laughs> oh, there are some questions. Okay, sorry, I didn't see your hand. I have no plan to be a, go into management. <laughs> I, I like my job too much. There's too much there. It's, it's a great place to be, I, if I didn't have to work nights. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? It's a really hard balance because it does take time. I think that up, the upfront time that I spend um, pays off in the end with less time uh, being spent because if you establish the boundaries you can just and the rules, I can come back to them all the time. Yeah, my charting suffers for sure. Um, I would say that you know I'll stay late because I've talked too much, but um, to me it's it's the payoff is so much greater and yet when there's someone who's critically ill within the unit absolutely I don't spend I don't sit down and spend that time because I can't but I find that if you have some specific statements that you can have in your head that I understand but statement works really quickly it shuts it down and um, it doesn't take long the first thing in the morning when you come in and introduce yourself to establish those like what do you want to do today I need to accomplish these three things what is it you want to do with every single patient and then you write it on your whiteboard or whatever you have in your, here in your institution, that works really well to initially set up your boundaries. And you also get a sense of, of how that patient's gonna, person's gonna react. We all can sense it walking into a room what the feel of that room is. So you know going in whether it's more casual and you can be quick or if you need to stop and spend that time. Nurses, you have an, an innate sense of the energy of a room and um, for sure, for sure, talking takes a lot of time. It does, but the, the payoff, the beginning, like you front load it with time and then in the end you, it's like teaching, teaching takes a ton of time. But if you front load it in the end, you, you end up with better at the end. So um, it, it meant that I didn't have to work. If I could, um, Peggy, Tracy and I could get Billy into a, a position where uh, he was no longer abusive and swearing and like throwing things, then I didn't have to work every day. Like, and make sure that my colleagues were safe um, so that they actually, um, when someone's a very difficult patient like that, they'll often change the assignment so that I have, like that we have less load then so we can deal with it and then move forward so that in two or three days we, everything evens out and it often does. But yeah, communication takes a ton of time. Yeah. We just had an example. My partner is, uh, I think she's 26. She's young and um, she is a person who would, um, she would either cry when she was stressed or she, and that happened often, or she said she would become aggressive and engage in verbal sparring. And just the other day we had a, a patient who's been very difficult to manage and um, she has uh, like drug seeking behaviors and that kind of thing. And um, when Michelle was, I think, five minutes late with her pain medication, she 
started yelling at her. I could hear her all the way down the hall and got up to go. And she came out with a smile on her face and she said, I did it. And she had used the, I understand that you are in pain, but, and shut it right down and then turned it within less than two minutes, had turned it and going the other day and then the day went on. And then after that, for the rest of the time that Michelle was taking care of that patient, she no longer had an issue because she'd set that boundary. She tried all sorts of other things with other nurses, but because Michelle had set that boundary and had said, no, this is my room to control, essentially, with her body language, she was able to manage for the rest of her set, so two days, two nights, without any problem. And this patient actually came to, be, like Michelle was one of her favorite nurses, because she knew what to expect, there was boundaries. So I know you have patient satisfaction. That's a big thing for you guys, the patient satisfaction surveys. That's not a thing for us. But um, I really think that the therapeutic relationship is enhanced through this as opposed to being affected. So it's, I think it's worth it in the end because as Michelle demonstrated, she just got her under control. And like it was literally two minutes that she had the, the situation turned as opposed to, you know, her escalating, yelling, carrying on, and then you know, to the point where you have a code white and that takes a whole lot more time and it's a lot of paperwork. Anyone else? Well, Melanie, I want to thank you for coming well, here. I hope everybody, like I said, took something out of this talk. <laughs>